Thank you. Good morning, Ms. Eisenberg. Good morning, Your Honor. Um, Beth Eisenberg for Anthony Martin. Uh, when this case, by way of extraordinary interlocutory petition, was reserved and reported uh, to this court in the fall of 2006, the governing thank you, protocol for obtaining, reviewing, and uh, introducing privileged records in evidence was the Bishop Fuller Protocol. And just briefly, by way of background, before getting to the merits, shortly before the defendant's brief was due, uh, this court issued its decision in Commonwealth versus Dwyer, which replaced the five-part uh, Bishop Fuller Protocol with a design, the thrust of which uh, recognizes and seeks to balance the defendant's constitutional rights, uh, the record subject's expectation of privacy and privileged communications, and the public's interest, as the court said, in expeditious prosecution of criminal matters. Now, the, the defendant briefed claims of errors by the trial court judge in her determination of whether the Department of Social Services records contained privileged communications pursuant to Bishop Step 1, and if so, whether those records were nonetheless relevant to the defendant's case and ought to be turned over to the defense counsel under Bishop Step 2. And it strikes me that what we need is a practical solution exactly. to this case, which falls in the middle of two different protocols. Yes, so I, I think that's right. And what much of that has fallen away in the wake of the Dwyer uh, decision right. is moot. So what we suggest this morning, or what I suggest this morning, is that what remains viable appellate issues for this court today are two questions. <coughs> Number one, if we accept that the DSS records, which the judge reviewed, are presumptively privileged, and, and we've argued that we do, um, defense counsel told the judge in a, in a colloquy during the motion hearing that he recognized that there was a privilege for communications to social workers who are employed by the Department of Social Work. So I think we services. can all agree on that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, there's a lot of things that you both agree on here, I think. Now, the judge may not have agreed, but um, do both parties agree that a relevancy determination needs to be made? Well, uh, You want to go to stage four, right? We, I argue that we're at stage four. What difference well, does it make if, if you go back to stage two, to you? As well, a, practi as yeah, a practical... How are you harmed? Well, as a practical matter, wouldn't we land in the... If, if the thrust of the decision is to get things moving, wouldn't we ultimately land in the same place? Which well, maybe yes, maybe no, but I mean, do we have to sort of split hairs? I mean, so, so you go back to stage two? Well, I think there are reasons n not to do that. I mean, I think there are good reasons not to do that, and I, I will address sure. those. Sure. Um, I, I, I think that with respect to the Commonwealth's position on going back to stage one, I think they suggested, I think that should be rejected for three reasons. First of all, the fact that there may be more than one putative privilege holder that's included or referenced in the records doesn't automatically uh, require that they be notified of the hearing. The question of notice, I think, um, to the particular privilege holder should be driven by the defendant's request as to that putative privilege holder and his showing of relevance and admissibility and necessity and specific specificity under Lampron as to the records of that putative privilege holder and not so what, what So what do we do? I mean, it, it strikes me that, as I understand this, uh, you filed a motion for the summonses pursuant to Lampron, right. appropriately so, right. and a very lengthy and detailed affidavit which seems to support uh, the issuance of the summons under Lampron. Uh, presumably the sum, well, of course they were, the summonses were then issued by the court, so to a certain extent the court has made the Lampron decision, at yes. least as it then presented itself. Yes. And we haven't changed Lampron in right. Dwyer. Um, uh, but the one thing that hasn't happened is that persons whose privileged or confidential information might be in those materials um, haven't been notified and had an opportunity to come in and say, no, those are my materials, they are not relevant, and there's a really good reason why they shouldn't be disclosed. How do we deal with that? Well. I, I think the first thing you look at is whether or not those individuals are, um, are, are, the, are the people that the defense attorney is looking to review the records, to, to get a chance to look at the records for, to see whether or not 
there's information there that's going to be. But haven't we said in the Dwyer Protocol that the third party should at least get uh, notice of these hearings? Yes, but if it were every third, I mean, it's a question of what's, what the, the essential reasons for notification are. The essential reason for notification is that the defendant is looking to effectuate the presentation of his defense, which may be confrontational as well. But, 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 but it sounds like you think you should be able to look at all the records, decide what you want, then notify the privilege holders. N no, I, I think what, what I've argued is that you should, that if there's an adequate showing under Lampron that targets that individual, in our case, it's the complainant. And it's only the complainant, by the way. Yes, but they've got records that relate to the children and other people, yes, right? Yes, but th those may not be germane. And those, it's clear that defense then counsel if, but if you about get, those Fine, things. if you give them notice and they come in and they start to argue, then you can say to the judge, but that isn't germane, and the judge will make a decision whether it is or not. It, it seems to me if that were how the court decided to handle <coughs> this problem, no one would ever escape from stage one because every time you looked at the records and you found reference to an additional individual who, whose confidentiality or even putative pr privilege may be raised, y you're triggered back to the judge for notification to that person regardless of I whether that's okay, so you're, you're suggesting that in other words, if there are interviews of the children in, these, in this DSS material, that they, they, sh they wouldn't be germane and they shouldn't be turned over. Uh, I, I'm they would be turned over, but they wouldn't be used. Exactly. I'm suggesting but that if they are used, or if defense counsel intends to use them. Oh, Ms. Eisenberg, though, the privilege is, I mean, it, it's the turning them over that's the problem. It's not, I mean, the using is a problem. It's a worse problem. But the turning over by itself is a problem. You want to you delay the notice to way down the road, to the fifth stage, to trial, to mm -hmm. way way down the road. No, I, I, what I say is one must rely on what defense counsel has presented to the court. Ms. Eisenberg, can I just interrupt to say this? There, there is, uh, I mean, it's an interesting hypothetical conflict between why you need the privilege holder um, at a relevancy determination. Because presumably, if it's relevant, Dwyer says produce. I right. think the advantage of having the privilege holder there is because the privilege holder might be able to say to the judge, judge, there are a lot of records here that concern me, but there are also a lot of stuff in these records, which by the way the defendant hadn't seen at that point, that concern my child or my mother or somebody else. Oh, says the judge, turning to defense counsel, What's the relevance of those? <coughs> None. Fine, you don't get those. It's not calling in those privilege holders. Now what happens in the case where the privilege holder who is before the court doesn't alert the judge to the fact that, oh, by the way, there are some records that involve other parties? Well then, mm -hmm. under the Dwyer Protocol, that proceeds and, you know, presumably do you then get the documents you look at them and you realize that there are some other privileges, but you're not going to use those. I mean, there, there is a, an attempt to balance interests here, but it seems to me that going back to having that determination with the privilege holder, the, in this case the complainant, being able to testify, would in fact advance what we're trying to do under the Dwyer Protocol, wouldn't it? Well, I we're not I saying, guess what... We're I not guess. saying pull in every other person who, whose records may be in the complainant's file. But if the judge turns to defense counsel and says, what's the relevance of those individuals, and defense counsel says no. Or, the, or defense counsel more likely fine. is going to say, Your Honor, I don't know because I haven't seen them and I'm not waiving my rights. Fine, let's get the privilege holders in. Right, and, and it seems to me that um, it's since time immemorial, it's always been the case that when privileged records come in and there's been a, an order fashioned allowing the defense attorney to see the records, this kind of situation may arise. Of course, but that's why, it, and that's why in this case it's not going to do any harm to your client. The judge may reach exactly the same determination. I, I mean, I really have a hard time understanding why you are fighting so hard not to go. I mean, I understand that you, you run the risk that there's going to be a different determination about relevancy. Seems unlikely to me. Uh, I mean, I think, I think my position is, is not even as 
sophisticated as that. I mean, you know, my position is if, the, if we concede that defense counsel understands these records to be uh, presumptively privileged, right. then in his review of those records, should there be anything in those, he, he's subject to a very stringent protective order. No, no, I understand that. And the but, but what is the harm of saying before they get turned over in an abundance of caution because these are privileged records, presumptively privileged, in an abundance of caution, we're going to get the presumptive holder of the privilege in to tell the judge whatever he or she wants to tell the judge. I don't know if the complainant is a he or she. I, I, th I, think, I, think, the only, I think the only downside, and it's considerable, is how often one is going to end up no, returning. No, it's on, the, the issue only arises now because you were caught, as were some other people, as we changed uh, the protocol. Th th this is not going to be a problem in the future. If in the future the privilege holder, the presumptive privilege holder comes in, in this case the complainant, and says absolutely nothing about anybody else's records in there, then I agree with you it's going to proceed just as it has in the past. If you try to use those records, you know, different issue. Exactly. But I, under the I protective agree. order, it's going to proceed just as it has in the past. Well. So your court, and, and again, weighing the interests of everybody, um, it, it seems to me that, that there's not a great deal of harm to your client. I assume if, if on another hearing with the privilege, presumptive privilege holder coming in, a different judge or maybe the same judge says, not relevant, you know, you can then try to deal with that. Well, that's what I had understood the, the whole thrust of the Lampron showing to be. I understand. Uh, and so... What we, were, what we were saying in Dwyer is, and don't think that we've written Lampron out of this. You've still got a high threshold of relevance. Uh, understood, and sure. I think that's right. And I think Mr. Osler showed that high threshold of relevance with respect to the complainant and clearly indicated to the judge that he knew, that he knew about the, the, pu the, the potential uh, adoptive parents and he knew about uh, the children and it was clear that he wasn't interested. Those aren't, those aren't witnesses or individuals that he's interested in because he knew about it. He knew their identities even at the point that there was a hearing. So, so the, the gist of our argument is knowing that. I, in this case, it seems that all of the prior three stages have been satisfied. Um, the, you know, there's been a showing of relevance. The records have been produced. There's been an assertion of privilege. The, by the, the records have been produced? To the court. Yes, oh, to, to the, the court. court. Okay, I'm sorry. The so the summons has gone out. The records have been produced. And indeed, the records that were non-privileged have been distributed. Correct. That's yeah. right. But, the, but you haven't satisfied the earlier stages requirement of notice to third parties. Well, so what? I, I, you still haven't really identified. Huh? Right. You still haven't identified the harm to you if we remand for a um, cons for notifying notice to go out to the third party so that their interests may be considered. I, I, I don't. I think the the only harm that I can that I can see is you know, the additional expenditure of time in, in going back to that stage. I, I didn't understand m my role as to demonstrate harm. I think that what I've demonstrated in the brief or what I attempted to demonstrate in the brief isn't that there's, there's any greater harm other than the time that's involved. Well, uh, certainly we, we've reduced the time even for you, greatly. Uh, we have reduced the overall time even for you who are caught between the two protocols. <coughs> well, and, and, and be that as it may, I mean, uh, uh, it seemed to me that what was compelling here is that eventually the defense would, the, having conceded that these are presumptively privileged, the defense would be in the same place. And Mr. Heisenberg, could I ask you this? I mean, obviously, you, have, you, have, you haven't seen the records, correct? I, I and the Commonwealth not. hasn't seen the records. I don't think so. And the judge has seen the records. The trial judge has reviewed them in camera. Is there some reason why the trial judge, um, I mean, if, why the trial, are there records that implicate the privilege of other parties that can be excluded from production? I think that's certainly possible. Um, it's it's unclear because it's it's unclear 
what what they are. They they appear to be an an, an, an aggregate of uh, adoption related records, and I don't know whether they were from the register of probate or. Okay. from DSS internal records, it's, it's hard to say. And I, I don't want to commit the defense. No, 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 I understand. I understand. I, I think the only thing, uh, other thing that I, I would argue is that I, I think that the decision uh, or, or the view that the records are absolutely privileged is something that both the Commonwealth and defense have agreed. Uh, there's no, there, there is no um, authority for that proposition. And, and I think it's worth uh, addressing that as well because that position both is now the law of the case and it also may affect other cases in the future. And so it, it's, I think it, it's useful to the, to the Just bar. Just reiterate the point. Yeah. Thank you, it, thank you, Ms. Eisenberg. Mr. Curtin. Good morning, Kevin Curtin, Assistant District Attorney from Middlesex on behalf of the Commonwealth. Mr. Curtin, let me ask you this. If there has been a determination, a judge has looked at these records, correct? Yes, Your Honor. And the judge has determined that they are relevant. She made some kind of a subsidiary mm -hmm. finding uh, that doesn't read very well. No, I thought she said that she would, that that was part of the whole problem. Instead of making the relevancy determination, she concluded she conducted an in-camera review and then refused to make a relevancy determination. She did. She refused to make the... Uh, the stage two relevancy determination, but there's uh, that's she that there are two problems here. One, she right. found these records to be absolutely privileged, which I think is wrong. And two, she um, refused to make a relevancy determination. But, but she did. There right. were some she said they would be relevant. I mean, it, yeah, it's in it's there somewhere. It's unclear exactly what records she's talking about, and it's not clear which <laughs> standard uh, of relevance she was talking about. Whether it was the Lampron standard, it appears not to have been the Lampron standard because it's clear that that the motion that should have been acted on, which is paper number 40, which is the defendant's initial Lampron motion, was never acted on. That well, in the, sense that, in the sense that summons is issued to compel the production of the documents, it was acted on. Well, uh, that, I mean, uh, the, the defendant didn't issue the summonses. No, the defendant didn't issue the summonses. Uh, they came from the clerk's office, and it's not clear uh, why or how they did uh, in the absence of an order by the judge because what happened was the judge put it over uh, until the 8th and then, so, uh, uh, then sometime after the 8th without ruling on whether the Lampron standard of relevancy had been met, the summons is simply issued. And because it all came up very close to the date of trial and the judge was trying to put it on the date of trial, keep the, keep the trial date, uh, but the defendant uh, really wanted this uh, material in quickly. It was all truncated into a very short period of time, which is very il sort of illustrative of the problems that we deal with in dealing with. I mean, the with motion says pers the defendant moves that the court issue these subpoenas for the production of records, and the court issued the subpoenas. So why can't we deem that to have been allowed? And the motion supported by a very lengthy uh, affidavit. I mean, well, there's what? two things there. I think that I think that the, 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 that the motion was not allowed. I think, think that it wasn't allowed? It, no, the motion was How not. How were the subpoenas yeah. issued? Well, it, uh, it may, they may have issued by in error out of the clerk's office on the basis well, of. Well, I've got to presume that it wasn't an error. I mean, I mean, she then reviewed the record, so I don't think it was an error. There's no, there's no endorsement on the motion. There's no action on the docket with respect to the hearing. Well, that's different. It, it's very odd, and uh, but the case is going to be remanded in any event. Mm -hmm. And the, really, the issue is: are the appropriate parties going to get notice? of any type, and if what we should do is, since there's no harm clearly to the defendant, in having a proper Lampron hearing, the transcript of what occurred on the 8th has not been transcribed, so it's not clear what did happen, but it uh, appears clear is that to trans is that Is that recording still available? I think it might be if it were requested, but uh, it was not requested by the defendant, and uh, it does not appear the judge acted on the Lampron motion. And I would submit, you know, uh, Your Honor, that if, if the judge were to look closely at the Lampron un under the standard of relevance, say another judge were to look at it, there would be a real question about whether these documents were going to be produced. Because the issue is the state of mind of the victim, whether she thought that her child was at stake, the custody of the child was at stake, and that's why she, had, uh, she supposedly that's made that's up going the story. To, that's, going, that, that's going to relevancy. That's not going that's to right. notice. Let, let, let me, <coughs> let me but, make... But Your Honor, I'm yeah. sorry. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, it's important 
because we now know that the Lampron stage, we may not have known this very well in 2006, but we know now that the Lampron stage is the critical point it at which this is. balancing of the interests commences. Okay, can I just clarify one thing? As far, at least as far as one justice is concerned, at a Lampron hearing, yes. um, if, if there's a determination uh, that records are presumptively privileged, um, the defendant may not know what's in those records. Notice is given to um, the, the holder of the presumptive privilege, and that holder comes in to address the court. All right. It's a, it's a kind of odd <clears throat> animal because if there's a determination of relevance under the very high Lampron standard, yes. it, it may not make a huge difference as to what the privilege holder says about, I don't want my records produced because it's going to do so and so. If the, the presumptive privilege holder does not identify that there are other privilege holders whose documents are in that file, yes. and, if the, and if the records are ordered mm -hmm. produced, and it turns out after the Commonwealth and the defendant had had a look at it, I hope nobody is assuming that you know, it turns out that there's a conversation between a third party that's privileged in that I hope nobody's going to come screaming back in again and to say we've got to go through this all over again. Everybody's under protective orders. Everybody's proceeding in good faith. That, that is true. Um, so that it may be in these circumstances, unusual circumstances, that notice has to be given to more than one presumptive privilege holder just because we now know. But it is not going to be the case in the future that if it turns out there's a stray document or even a hundred stray documents. I think you're right. This is okay. a chance to get it right. Well, this ordinarily you won't have the judge reading the record. Correct. This, no. Here the, the cart was put before the horse for some reason. Correct. And, and that's a good reason. Happen. That's a good reason to uh, uh, but, but, for the but, designation but, of presumptively just say privilege to be broadened. Because this is a, this may happen. be a chance to get it right in this case, but there should not be a conclusion that once the presumptive privilege holder has come <coughs> in, the judge has heard that person. If the privilege holder wants to come in, the privilege holder is not required to come in. The yes. judge has made a Lampron determination of relevancy. That's it then counsel are under very stringent protective orders, and That's nobody right. comes running back in again and saying, oh, by the way, there was somebody else's privileged record. Well, yeah. that's the importance of the hearing. That's the importance at the, I understand, at the critical but I'm stage fine of the And that's why people who are, may not be you know, the victim in the case, uh, persons who may turn out to have interests in, against dissemination, such as the foster parents who participate with DSS in placement of children who've been neglected or abused, they have rights too. And the judge Nobody's suggesting they don't have rights. Nobody's suggesting they don't have rights. I'm talking about if, there's an, if they're in the production of the records, once these presumptively privileged records have been produced. And it turns out that there's yet another party and there are privileged communications. Don't forget the mere reference mm -hmm. to a, I'm going to call a fourth and fifth party, right. may not make them privileged. But let's assume there is a genuinely privileged communication. Yes. That is not an opportunity for everybody to go back and say, we've got to redo the Lampron hearing because the fourth and fifth party that's weren't right. given notice. And I think the court has previously stated that failure to appear, say, at a Lampron hearing doesn't constitute a waiver of any privilege. Oh, of course not. And so we're protected. So, fa way. so failure not to receive notice doesn't either. <coughs> so let's go back to Dwyer. What, is, what does Dwyer require at this? <coughs> it requires that, this is the sta first stage, a motion is filed with an affidavit, and the court is required, or the to give notice. Well, actually, there's a Commonwealth is required to give notice to the third party subject, that which is, is the, the subject language. of the records, right? So, in this case, that would be the complainant. Yes. And the complainant certainly has had notice here and has made uh, her objections known. Uh, she did. All right. Anybody else required to get notice under the Dwyer Protocol as we've Designated. Under the language of the Dwyer Protocol, it says the third party subject, and it seems to assume that there is only one subject of records that is going to come in. Subject That's what I'm trying to make sure that everybody understands. That is to say, if the records are somebody else's records, in other words... Say if it identifies the location of the child or the identity of these uh, pr uh, pre-adoptive parents. Well... 
that once that Lampron hearing has been held, we don't, and, and the documents have been turned over, as Justice Cowan said, the judge isn't looking at the documents. We've made that clear, right? Right. And it turns out these are, that in looking at the records, there is information that, may, that, that is in fact a privileged communication. The mere yes. fact of information is not privileged. I but understand. let's assume that there's a genuinely privileged. There's a, right. there's a conversation between a, a future adoptive parent and his or her psych uh, psych psychiatrist. Okay. And it just happens to be in the file. We don't go back again because everybody is- You wouldn't need to. You wouldn't need to because then you'd be dealing with the evidentiary privilege. It's not waived and the trial judge can address it under the subsequent stages of the trial. Okay. So what is it that you're recommending here as to how we should proceed? I think- In this case. In this, in case. this case, it should be remanded for, uh, under the Dwyer protocol for a Lampron hearing so that our concerns, as you, as you know, is that- That's stage two? No, no, stage, stage one. one. Okay. Stage one, so that proper notice can be given to people and the record holder who has, the record holders have their own obligations with sure, respect sure. to uh, no, we've, notice. We've made that clear. Well, 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 surely the record holders had notice. In fact, they responded they, they with respond. affidavits, and so they had notice. They did respond, but not all record holders know what their duties are. And under no. the uh, Fair Information Practices Act, you know, you're, supposed, you're not allowed to give out private information. But, and I mean, this is DSS we're talking about. It is DSS we're talking about. So, well, so you're saying not. they should get a second bite at this apple? I think that, well, the department is required not to disclose under 66A. They have very, they have very experienced counsel. They know exactly what <laughs> they're doing. Everybody <laughs> makes mistakes, Your Honor. But, but, but the fact they that they made they a mistake. The re they submitted the records with a lengthy affidavit from counsel. Wasn't it from counsel? There was, there was a lengthy affidavit from counsel, but it, is it appears clear that uh, nonetheless, uh, the information that the judge was so concerned about was in the records. It was not redacted, even though it could have been redacted. The identity, for instance, of the foster parents or the location of the child, that could have that's been redacted. Not, but, that's not, but that's not going to be redacted under the Dwyer Protocol. So as you are now trying to get the protection of the Dwyer Protocol, why should you get that? That would not be protected under the Dwyer Protocol. It would be disclosed, subject to a protective order. We don't get the Commonwealth. The prosecutor doesn't get any. The prosecutor doesn't get anything out of it. It's the Commonwealth, the people of the Commonwealth, who have privacy interests in documents. But that's what's going to happen it. under the Dwyer Protocol. Well, it will. It, uh, it shouldn't. You're right. And this is a chance to get it right. Let's no, have no, a no, 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 no. It's, it, it, if this were proceeding right under Dwyer, yes. forget any prior thing, those documents would go with the information, with the information subject to a very, very stringent protective order. Only after a Lampron hearing, Your Honor, and only... Yes, uh, but they wouldn't be getting... Uh, and only after a review of the affidavits and a determination of relevance. You know, in this case, for instance, this is, this is, and this is important, the, uh, we really didn't understand what was up in Lampron and the importance of determining <laughs> that the relevance. That was obvious. It's very clear, in this case at least. And, and so now what we're talking about is the state of mind of the victim in thinking that DSS was going to take her child. Now, but why if do it you need if it these turns records out, for that? It, Mr. Curtin, if it turns out that, in fact, the judge did not make a relevancy determination, and Ms. Eisenberg said, who, it was a judge, male or female? Who's the uh, judge? Female judge. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. If, if Thank the you. judge did make, if she did make a relevancy determination, it puts it in a very different posture. If she either didn't or it's unclear whether she made a relevancy determination, then I think that you are on firm ground. Well, here's, here's what she says uh, at the September 12th hearing. I'm not giving you any records, even the ones that I think are relevant <laughs> in the TSS records. I'm not giving them to you. Okay, so um, she's that's after her in-camera review. I, now it's not a formal finding of relevance. And she goes on to say, "I'm not making any determination of relevance." Then goes on to say, "I'm not making any determination of relevance." So I. Well, I'll right. tell you one thing. That tends I, to support you. It, you, it you does can, tend to you support you. You cannot me. you cannot hand over under the Dwyer Protocol, or I would say under Lampron, you cannot hand over any records presumptively privileged or third parties. Unless they're relevant. Unless they are relevant and, you know, the sophisticated. The, that's, the, that's the importance of the Lampron hearing, to weed out. Absolutely. I mean, Lampron is very important, but isn't, uh, once, once you establish Lampron, isn't um, Dwyer essentially stock hammer, just dressed up in a little bit of a new suit of clothes? Well, we've gotten rid of the fuller standard of relevance. Correct. 
So, I mean, you got the Lampron standard of relevance, and then everything's yes. protected. And then, and then, you know, it, I think that's right. It, it goes, and the subject judge to a very strict protective order and the right of the privileged parties to, to comment, be to be heard. That's and right. That's about it. And that's Stockhammer with a few refinements. Don't there's forget. There's nothing wrong with that. Don't there forget. There wasn't anything wrong with that. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Curtin, don't forget, in the future, the judge is not going to have looked at the record. Yes. Okay? So this case, so getting it right, this case is sui generis. Or oh, there may be a little category of cases. Um, and so we will look very carefully at it. And as Justice Cordy suggested at the middle, slice this baby probably <coughs> solomonically. It's an opportunity. No. Thank you, Mr. In other Kirk. words, both of you will be unhappy. <laughs> <laughs>